hindsight, if I knew about a veterinary compounding pharmacy and what it could do, we can definitely elongate her life and give her a better quality of life as well. I'm Phil Hatterman, and this is Dog Words, presented by Rosie Fund. Today, Dr. Alan Chan from Golden Gate Veterinary Compounding Pharmacy explains an alternative to traditional drug delivery. After listening, you'll question why this is not more common for humans and animals alike. If you're new to this podcast, in each episode, we explore the world of dog care and companionship. We Save Each Other is the motto of Rosie Fund, which simply means the more we do for dogs, the more they do for us. And they already do a lot. If you love dogs, you'll love Dog Words. We welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions. Go to the podcast page at rosiefund.org to share your thoughts. We welcome suggestions for topics and guests. That's the only way we know which ones you like. Then we'll try to deliver more of that. Please download, subscribe, and most importantly, share Dog Words. Please follow Rosie Fund on social media. Subscribe to the free Rosie Fund YouTube channel that offers great videos of Rosie, Peaches, and Shelter Dogs, including some exclusive content. Celebrate five years of Rosie Fund by supporting our campaign to sponsor 50 dogs. You can donate on our website or Facebook page. You can also contribute by making a purchase from the store on our website or buying a t-shirt at bonfire.com. Links are in the description. This episode of Dog Words, as well as our previous two episodes, interviews with Labe Dodell from Barkay Dog Bar and Stephanie Robinson from Lucky 13 Rescue, have transcripts available on our Buzzsprout page linked in the description. The automated transcription is fairly accurate, but it is necessary to review each document before posting to make sure there aren't any substantive errors. So it will take some time to get all of our archived episodes transcripted. If there is an episode you would like moved to the top of the list, let us know at rosiefund.org. Next time on Dog Words, Kansas City, Missouri's Chief of Animal Services, April Moore, discusses the city's transition from focusing on animal control to animal welfare. The mission of Rosie Fund is to provide humans with the resources and education they need to give senior and harder to adopt dogs a better life. We thank you for joining our mission. Today's guest on Dog Words is Dr. Alan Chan, who is Quality Assurance Manager and Compounding Pharmacist with Golden Gate Veterinary Compounding Pharmacy. Welcome to the show, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Our description of what you do may have lost some of our listeners. They might be a little confused with being a compounding pharmacist (laughs) and working for a compounding pharmacy. So if you're listening to this and you don't know what compounding is, you're not alone. We're going to explain it. But first, I have some other questions for our guest. Because this show is Dog Words, I'd like to ask, do you have dogs? (laughs) I had dogs uh, growing up here in uh, California. Um, Most recent ones, they all passed due to old age. Most recent ones I have, I had three at a time. I had a Siberian Husky. I had a Papillon mix that was a rescue. And we also have a Pomeranian, a Tika Pomeranian that my wife bought in. <laughs> so we had three the most recent times. When I was growing up, when I was a kid, I had a German Shepherd mix. We also had a Queensland healer at the time. So one of my dogs, Kiki, who's a, my Husky, passed away because of a heart tumor. At the time, I didn't know about, even as a pharmacist, I didn't know that was veterinary compounding pharmacy. <laughs> The veterinary also didn't know about this. So she ended up prescribing the wrong medication. And also, basically in short, my puppy ended up passing away on her ninth birthday. And in hindsight, if I knew about a veterinary compounding pharmacy and what it could do, we can definitely elongate her life and give her a better quality of life as well. So I, and I'm very passionate about this. Incidents like those that you just described are so tragic and heartbreaking and anyone who's lost a pet just to natural causes old age it's devastating but when there's a situation where you feel like oh we could have done more if we'd have only known the fact is you did the best you could with the information you have right but what you've turned that into is instead of just saying that's so unfortunate I wish it hadn't happened, and then just going on with your life. You are helping so many other animals and their owners 
avoid the tragedy that you had to face. So thank you for that, using that as fuel for helping others. And we've had so many guests on our show who do that, so thank you for being one of those. We've had many veterinarians and uh, veterinary technicians even on the show who took varying paths to their professions, some knowing they always wanted to work with animals, some just kind of finding their way to that. As a pharmacist, that I don't think is a career path that many young people are aware of, that it can lead to working in the animal industry. What was your path to becoming a pharmacist and then ultimately working with drug compounding for animals? Yeah, that's an excellent question because I think I think to your point, you're correct. Not too many uh, student pharmacists even know that there is this option of veterinary compounding practice. So for me, I've always been a dog lover and animal lover. At the same time, I'm kind of a nerd <laughs> when it comes to uh, you know chemistry. I was going to say, with the science involved with becoming a pharmacist, <laughs> being a nerd will serve you well. <laughs> so I, I mean, I chose compounding as my career because I really enjoyed able to physically make and customize patient specific medication from scratch. Kind of like when you're in the kitchen, you're cooking, you're Mm -hmm. whipping things up. Compounding practice in pharmacy is traditionally, it was what the foundation of pharmacy is supposed to be. Treating patients as individuals with specific needs instead of going to, you know, like a big box uh, pharmacy store and get a commercially available product and trying to get what you need that is not specific for you. Yeah. If um, people can picture It's I, a Wonderful Life, that's what Mr. Gower did in Gower's <laughs> drugstore, that he was mixing up specific chemicals. He wasn't just counting pills and putting them in a bottle. Correct, correct. That, that is a good analogy. He did it poorly uh, as a <laughs> plot point in, in the movie, but still, that, I think, as you indicate, traditionally that's what pharmacists did. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, you know, one of the most notable part of what I love doing about my job is the opportunity to really partner with the experts in the respective fields whom they are very focused in getting their patients back to healthy. And we get to work together to figure out the root causes of the disease. And one of the ways to do that is to really get customized medications for your pets, for your patients. So I'm very happy and it is an honor to be the partner to make positive things happen. The pharmacy that I think most people are familiar with, and I don't even have to name all the chains, they're aware of them. You do get your consult briefly when you pick up a prescription that's more than just like a prescription painkiller and they go through like contraindications and ask if you have any questions and give you this huge piece of paper with six point font on it and say, you know, do you understand all of this that that goes on with your drug? But as far as the consultation that you're talking about working with veterinarians, working with those doctors to come up with a treatment plan, I don't think most people are aware that that kind of interaction is a possibility for human drug treatment, let alone for animals, that it's, it's more than just, again, counting out the pills that the doctor's nurse has phoned in to the pharmacy. That is correct. That is correct. That so, is definitely so, correct. So really, what is the scope of compounding? Yeah, again, I don't think most of our listeners are even aware what this <clears throat> even means. So walk us through what in general is compounding, and then we'll drill down on how this applies to animals. Yeah, absolutely. So the practice of compounding pharmacy in general, also including human compounding as well. Uh, In short, it's a custom making medications tailored to the patient's specific needs. So going a little bit deeper, in the veterinary world, our patients are very unique. So our patient comes in different species like dogs, cats, we have lions, tigers, penguins, monkeys, giraffes, and so forth. Physiology are different, sizes are different, different sensitivity to different medication, different chemicals that are potentially in commercially available product if you walk into a human pharmacy. So some of these things we can make it very specific for the patient to custom make it. So compounding pharmacy is a lot more technical compared to if you walk into a big box chain, human pharmacy. So our interaction with our patients and veterinarians are typically a lot more involved than a, even a typical retail chain pharmacy. 
because each uh, therapy is customized. So there is definitely a bit of educating and introducing ourselves to our patients, our owners, and our zookeepers of what exactly is involved in this whole process. What is compounding pharmacy? Why is it important in veterinary medicine? So some, sometimes even some veterinarians just don't know that we exist so that we can help them maximize their patients' therapeutic outcomes. Yeah, if your classmates so, when you were pre-farm and pharmacy didn't even know about some of these options, how would a veterinarian know? <laughs> yeah, that definitely have to do some research and, uh, and soul searching too to see what you want to get into as a student. When I was a student, I definitely have to do some soul searching to see what's available that would fit my personality. This is a special niche of veterinary compounding. How significant is the difference between a compounding drug and the readily available commercial drug option? Do you know that what costs about 75% of veterinary treatment fails? No. It's number one cost is non-compliance. So you go to the doctor's office Mm -hmm. or you take a pet sitter to your veterinary office, you want them to get well. So because of all these differences, we are here to make and custom make these type of special medications for each specific patient because there's just not enough commercial products out there to address our patients. And there's just enough also financially from a pharmaceutical industry standpoint. They just don't have that much incentive to develop and research these type of um, medications for pets and animals. And also the experience that we've had, particularly with our dog Peaches, is she will decide she doesn't like a particular pill and you can only fool her once. I've talked about this before on the show. So you can put it in a pill pocket and she'll eat it once. And then you can put it in a hot dog. She'll eat it once. Peanut butter and everything. Uh, Pizza pockets and with chicken and rice. uh, Smear it with bacon grease. So there's about a dozen things you can do. But if she has to take more than... 10 or 12 pills. She's recovering from a surgery. So there's maybe multiple pills those first few days and then other pills that extend out for a couple weeks. You get three or four days in and she's not taking the pills anymore. With a human, I think people are more likely to go back to the doctor and say, my spouse or my uh, child isn't taking this. What do we do? And they'll come up with something. I would imagine with a lot of pet owners, it's like, oh, well, I guess we're done with the pills. But there was a reason those pills were prescribed. Does compounding give an option for delivering them in a way that would make the user more compliant with the veterinarian's instructions? Oh, yes, absolutely. You brought up a point that it's probably one of the most, uh, the biggest challenge as an owner, as a zookeeper, on uh, how to make my pet more compliant because of uh, compliance difficulties. For example, you mentioned that, you know, if your pet's going to be taking 10 pills, for example, compounding pharmacy, what we can do, we can customize even the strength and the specific dosing, meaning that we can even increase the strength. So there'll be less volume or less pills you give to your pet. And we can change it to a different dosage form. For example, if your pet like to have a chew treat that's bacon flavor, we can certainly put into, into that. We can, uh, certain, certain medication we can put in in a micro tablet that's fast melting and it dissolves right away. We can do that as well. We also have target specific medications for, for example, for dogs. And number one cause of office visit is uh, canine otitis, which is ear infection. We also have targeted medication for that that's uh, administered directly. And we also have things like that for cats as well and other animals. So we can definitely adjust and customize the dosage form, the strength. We can even reformulate it if needed, if your pet is allergic to certain type of ingredients. So yeah, there's a, all kinds of customization and that's just where we come in and we consult with uh, your veterinarian office or your veterinarians to see what approach is best for your pet and also, we also talk to the owner to see, uh, first thing we check is, well, first, how is your relationship with your dog? Because if your dog doesn't mm-hmm. trust you, then we have to try different ways. <laughs> I mean, there's different, we, we try to customize even the approach, not just the medication, on how to make sure we are all on the same page of getting your pet back to healthy lives. 
if veterinarians don't know about this, and hopefully more veterinarians will be listening to this podcast, but certainly the pet owners who are listening, this may be opening their eyes that drug compounding is something I need to take advantage of because of the experience I've either had or that I'm currently having with administering drugs to my dog. Do they just need to tell their vet or do they need to contact the pharmacy or even how do they find a pharmacy that does this and know that it's the right pharmacy for them? Yeah, it's, I think it's a great question. Some vets do not know about compounding pharmacy. So it's great that if you as uh, the listener and also owners ask your vet to see if there are any compounding pharmacy in your area that specializes in veterinary compounding. So that's one way to go. Of course, you can always go on the internet, go on Google and search the pharmacy that you want to use, the compounding pharmacy you want to use. That's another way to do that. And of course, we also are reaching out to our veterinarian partners and to make sure that they understand what benefits we bring to their practice and how to treat their patients more effectively. Google has made all of our lives easier finding restaurants or when we can go to restaurants and uh, all kinds of services and getting definitions and stuff. But as far as the vetting, that's not always that reliable online. So even if someone does Google compounding pharmacies, how do they know which is the right one for them? That's a great question, Phil. It is very important to find the right veterinary compounding pharmacy instead of finding just any compounding pharmacy that also compounds human pharmacies, but they dabble in veterinary medicine from time to time because there are some potential issues with human medicine that cannot be, could be toxic or poison to animals. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that you choose a veterinary compounding pharmacy specifically that does veterinary medicine only. And, and once you find couple of candidates, you probably want to go into a couple of things that you can vet through. For example, are they PCAB accredited? So PCAB, short for Pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board, it's basically a seal of accreditation that meets uh, national quality standards for compounding. Here in the United States, have to meet stringent safety compliance and quality standards. So what this means is basically this pharmacy, who gets a PCAP accreditation, there's there's quite a few out there. The chemicals and the medicine we're using are coming from highly reliable suppliers. Pharmacists and technicians receive regular and specialized training. The facility must meet the design and other related standards to help ensure the area is clear and free of contamination. For example, we have a lab here with state-of-the-art clean room with a negative pressure room that in the state of our equipment to make sure everything is clean and it's proper. We have hood and everything that meet it. Um, make sure the pharmacy, the facility have to meet or exceed the USP 7 to 95 standards. I don't want to get too much into technical, but this is all the regulations to keep you and your pet safe. So that's PCAP accreditation. It's so yeah, it's a real accreditation. To, it's not just you've paid marketing dollars to be on their list that they actually vet each pharmacy that is on the list. I say yeah, that because yeah. I belong to professional organizations, some of which are meaningful and some are just cashing your check. <laughs> Correct. So this is, they actually send auditors come here and uh, we have to continue to pass a uh, certain test to be able to qualify to use this accreditation. So that's one of the most important when you're choosing a veterinary compounding pharmacy to have a PCAP accredited. In addition to PCAP accredited, uh, they want to make sure that there's a quality assurance policy and a program in place. This you may not be able to find on Google. Likely you won't be able to find Google. They may have a blurb about it on the About Us page, for example. But uh, you want to make sure that when you call the pharmacy, make sure that you ask, hey, how is your quality here? Why should we use you? It's, it's fair questions because you are taking care of your pet. It's, a, it's your family member. You don't want to just yelp a place or Google a place mm -hmm. and say, hey, you know, we'll just try this place out. You know, if it doesn't work, it's, you don't want to do that with your own doctor, do you? No, absolutely um, not. Yeah. <laughs> and, and oddly enough, some people don't. They just don't want to make a fuss. And that's unfortunate mm -hmm. if they are that either uncomfortable with having that conversation and being that committed to their own well-being. But with a pet, you 
have taken a responsibility to do what's best for that animal. And if you think it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation, well, suck it up. <laughs> you <laughs> have this responsibility. And, yep. and a good uh, pharmacist or veterinarian should welcome those questions. Absolutely. These are good questions to ask your veterinarians to see if they know any uh, compounding veterinary, compounding pharmacy, the good ones to refer to. And you can ask some of these questions. Um, Another point I want to bring up when you research for your veterinary compounding pharmacy is how available are the pharmacists in terms of not just for patient consultation, because like I mentioned, we are here to make sure that your pets get well, even after we can dispense a medication. So if you have any question at any point in time during the therapy, we want you to give us a call. We want to be part of, because we are part of the medical team, a lot of times it will be harder to reach the veterinarians than us. So we are here to help you. Also, how available are the pharmacists to have clinical consultations with the veterinarian, like recommending therapies and looking at CNS reports and things like that. That is one of the key things, how we can partner up. The back end of things that we do as pharmacists that the public generally don't get to see. Another thing to look for when you vet a a veterinary compounding pharmacy is how fast is the medication turnaround time? Because this is an important question. If there's an antibiotic that you need as an urgent medication, you want to make sure that the compound get made quickly and probably ship out within 24, 48 hours. Otherwise, you probably have need need to get a bridge therapy from the doctor's office to hold them through until you get the full supply. So that is a key question too. How's their customer service? Because this also linked to the access to pharmacists. If you have to call a veterinary compounding pharmacy, for example, and you have to wait 20 minutes on hold just to ask the questions, that's not going to make a pharmacist being very accessible. These are some of the most important things. And also ask your veterinary compounding pharmacy, do you have any big clients? Do you have any notable clients? Like for example, uh, for us, we have uh, San Francisco Zoo as our client, Humane Society, University of California, Davis, the vet hospital, UC San Francisco as well. Academy of Science, Monterey Bay, Aquarium, and so forth. So you want to make sure that they have notable clients because there's a trust level that's also involved with that, with the quality, because quality can be different between different compounding pharmacies. So that's why I'm listing all these things for to help you, to guide you on how to find the proper vet compounding pharmacy. And I'm going to try and find one locally for us because when you need a treatment, typically time is of the essence. You don't have a week to get this figured out. My dog is in surgery right now. So when I get the prescriptions, I need to know if these are going to work for my dog and not two or three days later when the dog's not taking the medication and then, okay, well, we got to figure something out. It's like, well, then you've wasted valuable time. I think would be good planning for our listeners to Find that pharmacy now and don't wait until you're sitting in the lobby at the veterinarian's office. Correct. So definitely ask about how long it takes to custom make that medication. What is the turnaround time? For example, ours, if it's a new prescription, we send it out the same day generally, if not the next day, depending on what time we get the prescription in and confirmed. And uh, you definitely want to ask about how their operation is. Well, I'm going to take a shortcut because you said ask who are your big clients, I'm going to go right to the source because I know a few people who work at the Kansas City Zoo and I'm going to ask them, who does your compounding? And uh, it might not be anyone I have access to, but if it is, well, then my search is done. (laughs) Yeah, you can definitely ask the zoo hospital. They should have some references. So that's a great idea. I really don't see any downside for the veterinarian that we've had non-traditional treatment options discussed on this show before, such as chiropractic and acupuncture. And one would hope all veterinarians would just want what is best for the animals. But there might be some who are a little defensive about, well, that's a treatment method that I'm not comfortable with, or that's unproven, or I haven't seen the studies. But with compounding, it offers benefits for the animal, but it's I don't see how it would be stepping on the veterinarian's toes in any way. They should be 100% on board with this once they find out about it. Yeah, so you're right. There was 
generally no downsides because we partner with your veterans. So essentially when the veteran sends us a prescription or when they give us a call for consultations, they are in fact bringing us on board as an extension of their care team. So this means that we become, we as compounding pharmacists and pharmacy become part of their team to be there to support them in their therapy. So our goal is not just to make a medication and dispense it, but also to follow through with the whole process, making sure that you have any questions, it's answered. If the doctor have any questions, it is answered. We're there to support them all the way through. What are some uh, treatment options that compounding provides that perhaps might not be obvious based on the limited knowledge that our listeners have so far just on what you've shared with us? Yeah, like I can give you um, an example. One of the top causes for canines going to the doctor's office is canine otitis, which is ear infection. So let's say, for example, if your puppy refuses to take antibiotic orally, so we custom make a combo ear medication antibiotics for your puppy to specifically target the specific bacteria that is causing the infection in a specific ear, maybe even both ears. So the the antibiotics that the ear antibiotics that we make, it's a biphasic gel. So this is very interesting. It's developed and designed to administer it as a liquid directly into the long ear canals. And once the liquid reaches the site of the infection in the ear canal, it is designed to solidify in place and releases the active medication directly to the targeted site of the infection just over the next few days as it melts away. So this is a targeted approach that is effective, not only to decrease the risk of side effects if you were taking it orally, you know, if you take it orally, you can Mm -hmm. have potential GI issues, vomiting, diarrhea, could be messy. It also directly treats the site of infection, meaning it's a lot more effective and much more faster in recovery time and also uh, decrease your costs and and medication and doctor's office bill. And you don't want to overuse antibiotics. Of course, you know this, and I hope most of our listeners know this because that can create strains of uh, infections, bacteria, virus, et cetera, that are resistant to antibiotics. So having something that is specific and targeted is to some extent going to mitigate that downside of using antibiotics. Yeah, that, that is correct. So one of the things that we work really closely with a lot of veterinarians, a lot of listeners may not be aware, is that because we partner with your veterinarians, we sometimes uh, the veterinarians will send us their lab reports, for example, uh, the cultural and sensitivity report. And then we will look at it to see, hey, let's see which medication would be the most effective, which combination of medication would be most effective and what concentration would be most effective to treat this. And then we'll consult with the veterinarians and then we'll make our recommendations and then uh, we'll go from there. For example, like enrofloxacin, it's a good drug that we use for uh, a lot of the canine otitis that we use to target ear infections. So this is one of the medications that we can make in combination, usually two or three sometimes even four medication into the formulation that we use as a target approach. So everything is specific. We not just have a menu and you choose from it. We talk to your doctor, make sure that this is the right approach and we are on the same page. Then we explain this to the owner, we educate and so we, everyone's on the same page and then we'll approach this together as a team approach. I have a question that could be kind of loaded. So I'm not going to ask it as a question. I'm going to make a statement and you can choose to clarify if I'm off base on this. Sure. Anytime there is either another treatment option that people hadn't considered or a uh, additional treatment, even though people love their pets, cost is a consideration when you're making these decisions. An initial reaction might be, well, this is obviously more expensive because it's more complicated, but my assumption would be if peaches is only taking five of the 32 pills she was supposed to take, I've still bought 32 pills. So if compounding means she's actually getting the medication, that is a better investment. But also, if you get the treatment that, for instance, with what you're describing with the ear infection, that is very targeted and specific and treats that issue then it's taken care of. 
Whereas if the dog's not taking mm-hmm. the medication, you're going to have to have another vet visit. Mm-hmm. This Correct. issue isn't going away, or it may cause other issues as the pet is compensating for their ear infection or their joint inflammation or whatever their issue might be. I don't really see cost being a factor that would discourage someone from compounding. It seems like there would be cost benefits to using drug compounding. Does that make Correct. sense? Yes, Because I don't know sense. based on regulatory laws and stuff if you can say that, but I'm the host <laughs> of the show, so I can say whatever I want, and you can tell me uh, to go pound sand that I'm way off base if necessary. You know, that's a great question because as we get a lot of questions from our owners. How can we minimize the cost? Because it costs... A lot of medications for veterinarian uh, medicine is not covered by insurance like humans, for mm-hmm. example. So you do have to pay out of pocket. Tell me about so it. we understand. <laughs> <laughs> we, we I have do a 14 year old dog. I'm well aware. <laughs> <laughs> it can get a little pricey to some extent. But for us, we are cognizant of the cost of the medication. And it is our goal to make sure that our owners and our patients are getting the most cost-effective therapy possible. That's also part of our consultation with our veterinarians to see how we can make sure that we can have a cost-effective approach to get the therapeutic outcome that we need. So we are an advocate to all the owners to make sure that your pet will be well with the most cost-effective way. That makes sense. Yes. And when you have the options for how it's delivered as far as whether it's a liquid, whether it's a food flavor additive or the strength of the dosage, that flexibility obviously is going to lead to pricing flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. Which you don't get with many other options. It's either you either buy this bottle of pills or you don't. Exactly. So we definitely have that flexibility. We can try different things, different ways that are more effective. We can combine certain medication into one, which sometimes can be even more costly. It sometimes costs less than if you're giving 32 pills to peaches and then five. So sometimes if you get five, it might not cost as much as 32 in that respect. So yeah, it's definitely flexible from that standpoint. Does Golden Gate work outside of San Francisco or are you just local? We I asked that because I could, I could, I just Googled. I don't see a lot of options for me locally. (laughs) I was listening while um, I was Googling. I don't typically multitask. I usually give my undivided attention, but I wanted to be prepared with this question while I have you on the line. (laughs) So one of the things you want to do is uh, when you're trying to find the right veterinary compounding pharmacy is there's not too many of us around. There are some. One of the things you want to find out is rather if they ship to your state because it has to be a license in your state to meet the state regulation and state laws to ship to, to be able to send your medication. So for us, we generally operate uh, most of the West Coast. We do have uh, closest to you. We have Colorado and Wisconsin and also New Mexico as well. Wyoming, Montana. That's the closest we get to Kansas. <laughs> well, we have um, listeners we around have... the world. So our listeners who are from the Rockies West have access yeah. to Golden Gate and a link to them will be in the description for this episode. But for others, just need to do a little research. Yeah, we also uh, ship to New York, Massachusetts, and Florida. And we are in the process of uh, See, now you're just making licenses. me feel bad. You're just dancing all around Missouri. <laughs> but we're getting there. We're, we are slowly approaching to your area. I appreciate those efforts on our behalf or the behalf of, uh, of our pets. I know this has been eye-opening for me, and I'm pretty sure it's been eye-opening for our listeners, not just as it pertains to their pets, but also for themselves. I I think people might uh, explore their compounding options for their own medication as well as their pets. And that alone will, I think, get the word out there that there's this option. You don't just have to settle for the cookie cutter options that have been uh, historically offered to patients, whether human or animal. Yes, that is correct. It's it's definitely a much more customized approach that 
at the end of the day, it's going to get your pet well faster and more cost effective. If anyone has more questions, as Dr. Alan Chan indicated, you can Google compounding to find the closest pharmacy near you. You can also contact Golden Gate Veterinary Compounding Pharmacy. Just go to their website, which again is going to be linked in the description for this episode. And they have a mailing list, so you can learn more about compounding. And I'm sure if you're on that mailing list, will be a notification every time there's a state added to your coverage. So if someone doesn't have a pharmacy near them, hopefully Golden Gate will be coming perhaps to Missouri someday soon. Definitely, very soon. We're working on it. Next staff meeting, say, this is our top priority. I don't know how much weight (laughs) your word has, but whatever pull you have, put in a good word for the state of Missouri. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, any exciting updates that you have in the future, circle back, let us know, and we'll have you back on again. Great. Thank you so much, Phil, for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I'm Phil Hatterman, and you've been listening to Dog Words, presented by Rosie Fund. Thank you to Dr. Alan Chan from Golden Gate Veterinary Compounding Pharmacy for joining us today. This episode description has a link for their website, as well as a link to the Pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board's online compounding pharmacy finder. Remember, just because a pharmacy is accredited does not mean it specializes in veterinary pharmaceuticals. So use what you've learned from this episode to have a conversation with them to confirm that they can meet your needs. Next time on Dog Words, Kansas City, Missouri's Chief of Animal Services, April Moore, discusses the city's transition from focusing on animal control to animal welfare. A big thank you to Alternative String Duo The Wires, featuring cellist Sasha Groshong and violinist Laurel Morgan Parks, for playing the wonderful music you've heard on today's and previous episodes of Dog Words. Supporting The Wires supports our mission. Learn more about The Wires at thewires.info and download their music on iTunes. Check out fiddlelife.com and learn to play the fiddle and cello fiddle online from Laurel and Sasha, even if you've never played before. Celebrate five years of Rosie Fund by supporting our campaign to sponsor 50 dogs. You can donate on our website or Facebook page. You can also contribute by making a purchase from the store on our website or buying a t-shirt at bonfire.com. Links are in the description. As always, please download, subscribe, rate, and share dog words. This helps us with sponsorships. Then Rosie Fund can help more dogs. Send us your comments, questions, and suggestions at rosiefund.org. And let us know if you would like to be a sponsor of the Dog Words podcast. Thank you for listening. And remember, we save each other.